I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining the Environmental Priorities Coalition policy webinar. Uh, my name is Morgan Michael. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a field organizer for Washington Environmental Council and Washington Conservation Voters. Um, just a few notes for our participants. Folks are muted since we have about 40 people on the call right now. Um, if you have a question, there is a box on the bottom of your screen where you can type in questions during the webinar. Um, if you are on the phone, and we do have some folks joining us by phone, you can text me your questions at 206-631-2635. And I'll just repeat that for folks on the phone. It's 206-631-2635. So you can text me a question, or if you've joined by computer, you can write it into the Q&A box. There is a chat feature as well. If you wanna use the chat feature, you can either chat directly with the panelists or chat with attendees. Um, we will collect questions throughout the webinar. Um, you'll be able to view the questions other folks have asked. So maybe take a scan and see if someone's asked a similar question. I'll try to aggregate them and ask our panelists the questions at the end of the webinar after they've presented on the policies so that folks can hear, um, can hear on the phone the questions being asked and answered. Um, so those are just a few sort of like technical points before we get started. Um, and just to orient everyone, uh, this is uh, the Environmental Priorities Coalition uh, policy webinar. So the Environmental Priorities Coalition is made up of more than 20 statewide organizations working to safeguard our environment and the health of our communities in the legislature. And for the 2020 legislative session, we have adopted four priorities uh, for healthy communities and a thriving environment, which we're gonna delve a little deeper into tonight. Those are clean fuels now, reduced plastic pollution, climate pollution limits, and healthy habitats, healthy orcas. So um, just for a little context as well, this year's legislative session is a short session, uh, meaning we have about 60 days or two months to pass these four policies, along with a lot of other policy. Um, so we really need uh, advocates and activists like yourselves to be engaged and it's so great to have so many of you on the call tonight. Um, so and another reminder is we do have our Environmental Priorities Coalition Lobby Day coming up soon on Thursday, January 30th in Olympia. If you haven't registered yet, uh, register. It's gonna be awesome. Um, and it'll be an opportunity to speak with legislators directly about all the policy that we're talking about tonight. Um, and if there are any technical issues or if you have any questions about technical stuff, again, uh, feel free to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A, uh, and I will work on fixing any technical issues folks are dealing with. And uh, one more time for folks on the phone, if you're having an issue, uh, my number is 206-631-2635. So without further ado, we're going to start to hear from our policy experts on the call. Uh, we're very lucky to have with us Vlad Gutman from Climate Solutions, uh, Heather Trim from Zero Waste Washington, Rebecca Ponzio from Washington Environmental Council, and let me, Amy Carey from Sound Action. Um, so we're going to start with Vlad from Climate Solutions talking about clean fuels now. Vlad, we can't quite hear you. There you go. How about now? Is that better? Now we can hear you, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that. There's there's buttons all over the place, and I don't know all of them that I need to mash. So, um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. So, yeah, clean fuels, uh, clean fuels now, the clean fuel standard. Really excited about it being a priority this year. It's been something that um, the environmental community and, and members of the environmental community has been working on in one form or another for something like seven or eight years at this point. Um, it, it's the most uh, most substantial carbon reduction proposal that uh, is in front of the legislature right now. Uh, they it would reduce 
um, approximately 6 million tons of carbon emissions per year from the largest source of emissions we have in the state, which is the transportation sector, and it would do it by 2035. So this bill, which is, uh, is proposed by Representative Joe Fitzgibbon and Senator Saldana, will would require a 20% reduction in the carbon intensity of transportation fuels in Washington State. And so what that, what that would do is it would drive the adoption of electric vehicles, cars, trucks, buses, it would support their deployment, make them more affordable and cheaper, and it would uh, help deploy some of the more sustainably produced and lower carbon biofuels that, that are available uh, into our fuel supply so that uh, it would help replace our use of liquid fuels entirely and while we continue to use liquid fuels to make sure that they're as clean as possible. So um, uh, through this sort of combination of sources, it creates this reduction requirement that the transfer, that the oil industry and oil importers have to have to comply with. And they do this by kind of supporting and, pro and providing direct subsidy and support for these alternative fuels uh, that would uh, that, that gradually would replace the, our reliance and dependence on petroleum. California, Oregon, and British Columbia all have this program and have had it for, for several years. Oregon was the last one to adopt it in 2015, but California and, and British Columbia adopted it nearly 10 years ago and have seen a lot of success in deploying new alternative fuels. Oregon has um, seen just a penny per gallon increase in the cost of fuel while at the same time uh, reducing um, uh, I believe approximately around a million gallons, uh, excuse me, a million tons of emissions uh, associated with transportation per year. California, uh, who's further along, has re replaces over two billion gallons of ga gasoline gallon equivalents a year with alternative fuels like, uh, like, like electricity and uh, and renewable diesel and things like that. And so it's a really successful program in in, in driving a market transformation, and getting us off of our dependence and reliance on 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 oil, which we have uh, you know started a century ago, and we we really need to break as urgently as possible in order to do what we need to do on climate. Uh, really excited also to, to sort of highlight the really significant air quality and public health benefits. You know, the combustion of fossil fuels, is, as I'm sure everyone on the call knows, it isn't just bad for our climate, but it's bad, to, it, it's directly harmful to human health. You know, diesel particulates, uh, NOx and SOx and other kinds of criteria, dangerous criteria pollutants, uh, they, lead, they lead to lung disease, asthma, uh, lung cancer, um, and a number of other kind of conditions and afflictions that people sort of have to struggle with, and especially those that uh, live closest to our, to major roadways. Those are overwhelmingly low-income folks or, 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 uh, and or communities of color, folks that more, the most directly have to deal with the impacts and burdens of our, of the, our transportation system, which is so reliant on fossil fuels. And so by helping transition off of these fuels and reducing a reliance on fossil fuels, not only are we cutting the carbon emissions and, and doing helping do our part for um, global climate stability, but we're also contributing to air quality improvements and uh, improve public health for, for folks that are the most exposed to the to the uh, air toxins that, that cars and trucks and things like that are responsible for. And that's why we're so happy to have the support of the Washington State Medical Association, the Washington Academy of Family Physicians, American Lung Association, the Washington State Nurses Association, and a group of hospitals, all because they recognize that these sort of pulmonary disorders that are sort of a direct result of the air toxins that we breathe associated with how we get around, getting off of those, reducing those is going to contribute to improved quality of life for people and longer lives as well. And, and that those benefits will especially accrue to vulnerable and, dis and, uh, dis and dis uh, disadvantaged populations that, that are the most exposed to the harms of fossil fuels right now. So uh, policy passed uh, the House of Representatives last year. We're hoping to see it come out of the House of Representatives this coming week and then go over to the Senate. And we, we really need your help and, and advocacy in making sure the senators know that, that this policy, which like I said, is the, 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 the most ambitious carbon reduction uh, proposal the legislature is currently considering is, is a priority for you, that you expect them to, to not go home without it. And, and hopefully we can get it across the finish line this year and, and join our, our West Coast peers in, in, in really driving the clean energy transition uh, that we need in the transportation is like our greatest source of emissions. So I'll, I'll stop there and i um, happy to take questions when, when, when it's time for that. Thank you, Vlad. Um, there was a request from our audience to make sure to share the bill numbers. Um, so just a reminder for panelists to share bill numbers so that everyone in the audience knows which bills to reference. Um, and yeah, so the, oh, 
Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to answer that question for the clean fuel standard. So it's in the house, it's um, it's 1110-1110. And then in the Senate, I believe it's 54, the Senator Saldana's companion version is 5412. The Senate just heard it, um, gosh, was that, was that this week, uh, earlier this week or, or last week or something like that. The House doesn't need to hear it because it's far enough advanced in the process. And so after the House hopefully votes on it and sends it over to the Senate, we'll expect another hearing in the Senate Energy, Environment, and Technology Committee on the House vehicle. And so we would expect the House vehicle to be the, the, the sort of the prime one that we would you know, hope to get to the governor's desk. So that's um, that's 1110 is the sort of the main vehicle and then 5412 is the Senate companion. Thank you so much, Vlad. Um, let's go over to Heather Trim with Zero Waste Washington to talk about uh, reducing plastic pollution. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can you? Okay, terrific. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay. Can you see that? Can you see the can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Uh oh. Morgan, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay, hi everybody. Good evening. Um, this is Heather Trim and we are working on the reusable bag bill fifty three twenty three, the Senate. Um, Bill is the vehicle, and the partners who are in the leadership are Zero Waste Washington, Surfrider, Seattle Aquarium, Puget Soundkeeper Alliance, and Environment Washington. So I'm going to ta start a talk about the problem, the history, and the solution. So we live in a plastic era, as I'm sure you all are well aware. Um, for, this shows from 1950 to 2015, the global production and use of plastics um, by sector. So the uh, green, for example, is construction and building, and the bottom, the blue, is packaging. That is 30 to 40 percent of the use of plastics, and that includes everything from bags to, ba to bottles to the wrap around your toilet paper. So that's something we can do something about. So one of the challenges in our world uh, with regard to plastics is that bags in particular are buoyantly um, neutral. That means that they are floating in the water column and they look like uh, uh, squids and um, things that they are the favorite food of the sea turtle. So that's why you see this sort of famous image that's been around. Um, unfortunately, the bags get into the sea turtles and they um, clog their intestines and make it hard for them to eat and uh, many, many other species as well. We don't have so many sea turtle species here in the Salish Sea, but we do have gray whales. This is a gray whale that died in 2010 in Alki in Seattle, Alki Beach. And when they cut open its stomach, they found 20 plastic bags and other plastic items. Um, they, it probably didn't die from the, the plastic in its stomach, but it eats along the bottom. It takes everything in as it's eating. And so likely um, this is what it was having in its final meals. We also are concerned um, in terms of the litter and that then of course that washes into our waterways. And in terms of commercial compost, the when you look up close, I hate to say it, but when you look up close to our com compost, what you see is a lot of plastic bags and other plastic items, but in particular plastic bags because people are confused and think that they get the bags out. One big issue with bags and wrap is that in the recycling facilities, they wrap tightly around the rollers and they clog up the machinery so that for every eight hour shift, they have to spend one hour going in and cutting the bags and film off the rollers with knives and drills. And it's very dangerous and it's costing us ratepayers money. So let's talk about what kind of legislation we have in the United States right now. The green on this map of the U.S. shows the states that have actually passed bag bills. Um, in this, this past year, there were quite a few passed after we did not succeed last year. So um, the territories all have addressed bags, which is quite embarrassing. And in Hawaii, each of the counties has. So the green represents where the entire area has been is under a bag bill. The purple indicates states where you have some cities and some counties that have passed bag bills, ordinances. In Washington, we are now at 37 reusable bag ordinances at the local level, 12 in 2019. 
Most recent one in Bothell was the Winning Star. That is a fabulous ordinance, local ordinance. And um, Polpo is going to be looking at one on February um, 5th. So that will give us up to 38 potentially within a month. What, what, what does the bag um, bill at the state level do? It says no thin plastic carry home bags. And then there's an eight cent charge, pass through charge on paper bags and 2.25 mil thick bags, plastic bags. The store keeps the money. This is critical for the independent grocers because the paper bag costs between 10.5 and 12.5 cents. And um, now just the little thin plastic bags cost around one to three cents. So it's a huge jump up in cost for the stores. But of course, what we want people to do is bring their own bag and then there will be no charge. The um, Critically, this will exempt anyone who is using a food assistance program to purchase their items. They will be exempt from the charge. And it exempts bags that address these things. So bulk bags, produce, dry cleaning, um, things like when you have a bloody chicken, newspapers, and uh, pharmacy bags. And that is the conclusion. I'm looking forward to questions at the end. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I'm going to remind folks who have questions if you can include what bill, if there's a specific bill or policy you have questions about, or a specific person you'd like to ask the question to, please include that because that'll help us at the end. Um, thank you so much, Heather. And then I think next we're going to go to Rebecca Ponzio to talk about the climate pollution limits bill. And Rebecca, you're on mute, just so you know. Um, oh, okay, am I, am I on now? Yeah, you're on. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And there we go, can you see it? Yes. I'm going to, okay, um, so thank you all for joining this um, policy webinar on the Environmental Priorities Coalition Priorities. My name is Rebecca Ponzio. I am the Climate and Fossil Fuel Program Director with Washington Environmental Council, Washington Conservation Voters, and I get to speak to the Climate Pollution Limits Bill, House Bill 2311, Senate Bill 6272. Uh, sponsored by Representative Slatter, Senator Doss, and it is a governor request legislation. So whether it is the fires that are burning hotter and more frequently the health hazards that we're all facing, the rise in diseases and instability globally, climate change is a defining issue that impacts all of us here in Washington and across the world. And as a state here in Washington, we have an important role to play in addressing our emissions and our role and our, uh, the work to do to reduce those emissions. In 2008, the legislature adopted limits for what our state needs to reach for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions alongside a requirement to review and evaluate those emissions regularly. Those limits were outdated then, unfortunately, and they're very outdated now and do not reflect the urgency of the crisis, nor the current science. And those limits um, do not reflect and do not have a policy to account for the work that our natural and working lands do for our climate, which is a really big gap in how we address climate here in Washington. This is uniquely important here in Washington, where there are approximately 22 point million acres of forested land, 14.7 million acres of farmland, 930,000 acres of wetland, all of which could be utilized for their sequestration potential and incorporated into our overall state policy. So this year, um, the legislature is taking on updating the climate pollution limits to reflect our current science, set policy around the importance for sequestration and strengthen the overall inventory and tracking of action related to those emissions. Specifically, we hope that the legislature will adopt limits to reduce our greenhouse emissions 
so that we are 45% below 1990 limits by 2030, 70% below 1990 limits by 2040, 95% below 1990 limits by 2050, and achieve a net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. It also means incorporating sequestration into our um, policy and, of course, strengthening the inventory so that we understand sector by sector how the emissions are adding up and how we're meeting those limits. We are also, as a community, advocating that those um, the inventory includes a consumption-based emission effort, so not just those emissions generated here in Washington State, but also those um, that are emitted because of the consumption that we have in Washington State so that we're not shifting our climate pollution elsewhere. Um, this bill is really a continuation of the work that our state and our governor has been doing and reflects Washington taking on our role in addressing the climate crisis seriously and importantly fills these gaps that I flagged um, for the ongoing work for our climate action. I wanted to share this graphic that we have that really captures what the bill does in terms of updating the limits to prevent greenhouse gas emissions, reduce and track our current emissions, and um, incorporate the removal of carbon through sequestration into our climate policy. By updating the limits in this way um, that ties all these pieces together, we um, will have the right foundation from which to measure and implement the tools that we know we need to have. For example, the clean fuel standard that Vlad spoke to at the top of this briefing, as well as things like considering pollution from our state's purchasing power, investing in energy efficiency and weatherization, prioritizing efficient and equitable transportation options, and much more. Those are the policies that alongside adopting this bill, the legislature must pass in order to implement and achieve our greenhouse gas emission limits. The work that the legislature did in 2019 to phase out things like super polluting hydrofluorocarbons and getting to 100% clean electricity are great examples of what the implementation looks like alongside the policies in play this year. Um, and together, I hope that we can work to both ensure that our state has the strong foundation to set and establish where we need to go alongside the work to pass those policies to achieve limits. For a quick update on where the bill is, the House Bill 2311 passed out of the House Environment Committee today, which is super awesome, and it passed out um, stronger than it entered, which is great. It's now heading to appropriations and then um, rules and hopefully a floor vote soon. So I hope that you can get engaged, contact your legislators, get the message out about the importance, the important foundational um, effort that this policy provides alongside the implementation policies we need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, that was great. Um, so I think our last and our final, our final panelist will be Amy Carey from Sound Action speaking about the Healthy Orca, Healthy Habitat bill. Uh, so Amy, I think you're muted currently. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good, great. Hey, thank you for that. Um, hey, I want to start, first off, um, sorry, I can't be here as a video participant. I'm sort of lucky enough that part of my work um, sometimes has me in the field with Southern Resident Orcas, and I got to do that today. So um, J-Pod and K-Pod, say hi to everybody, uh, and thanks for the good work. But I um, wasn't able to get back to a place where I had reliable video. I also wanted to just say thanks to everybody um, that's joining in on this call. Um, you know, we all lead such busy lives, and I can't tell you how important it is. Um, for those of us, I think, in the environmental world and with these organizations and to have all of you sort of standing up here with us and taking time out to listen to policy talk and see how you can help. So kind of a round of applause to everybody out there in the world. Um, so I work as the director of Sound Action. Um, just a little snippet of what we do. Um, we work as an environmental uh, regulatory watchdog organization and our work is focused on the Salish Sea and marine waters, the Washington State portion of the Salish Sea. So that's everything from 
Canada on down to the deepest sort of embayments from Olympia. Um, a couple years ago, we were really um, thrilled to uh, join in on the prey availability work group that um, was put together in support of Governor Inslee's work task force. Um, and really um, are so excited to be a part of the Environmental Priorities Coalition. And I just want to take a minute here too to really recognize how unique that is and what a strength it brings to this region. You don't see this kind of um, strong across the boards environmental group collaboration in many other parts of the country. So the EPC has dozens of organizations in the region and the state saying we're going to step up and join together and be stronger together and work together to build these priorities. That's a really, really remarkable thing. So I, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that too. Um, and again, why we're so honored to be a part of the EPC. And everybody here who's a participant, you're, you're a part of this team. So we're all in this together. So um, I'm gonna touch briefly on um, the priority, uh, the Healthy Habitat, Healthy Orcas priority that is uh, part of our legislation this year and an EPC priority. It's House Bill 2550. Um, we have a range of sponsors, but we've been um, closely working with uh, um, Representative Kenoff and, and Representative Fitzgibbon. And really, um, when I mentioned the prey availability work group and the task force, this legislation, this priority was born of that effort and that action. Um, you know, the prey work group had this uh, task put forward to us of, hey, the orcas are starving. Can you all, and there was, you know, 30 different people in that room representing different organizations and our tribal partners. We were tasked with to sort of, hey, figure out how we get as many salmon into the mouths of orcas as quickly as possible. And um, the prey availability work group came up over the course of a couple of years with some recommendations that were intended to be bold actions to move forward. Those recommendations were moved to the task force who adopted um, many of these same recommendations um, as, as really clear indicators of what we need to do right now to recover salmon and recover orcas. And so this Healthy Habitat, Healthy Orcas um, priority really was born for that. And, and now I'm gonna sort of dip in a little bit into the regulatory wonky world here, so bear with me. Um, what this priority calls for is a state policy to be adopted that moves from a standard that we now call no net loss to a standard of net ecological gain. Um, no net loss is a standard that's been sort of on the books for many, many years now. And in this state, if you're doing development, some different land use actions, um, uh, different sort of, uh, Im uh, uh, sort of human, human uh, impacts there, you're required to meet a standard of no net loss. And generally what that means is that if you have impact and you're that applicant or the person doing the development, uh, or the company or the agency, that you're required to take mitigation actions, that the end result of that would be that you do um, compensatory mitigation or offsetting mitigation with the intention of balancing out those impacts. So that if you do X amount of damage, you do X amount of offsetting to try to get back to that baseline of where you started. So that there's no net loss of that habitat that you've impacted. What we know, unfortunately, is that no net loss does not work. Again, this has been a standard for many years. Um, and even though it's well-intentioned, uh, we see clear indicators uh, and indications of it not working, whether that's um, uh, you know, in upland areas where forest canopy habit uh, habitat's being lost, we have a wide range of nearshore habitats that show us that it's not working, whether that's vegetation disappearing, forage fish spawning, um, habitat and species disappearing. And that brings us to salmon that are at a you know, fraction of their uh, populations uh, that they were decades ago. And then of course that brings us to starving orcas. And all of that habitat loss, which we know is what's, um, uh, you know, uh, which we know is, this, is this what's having the end result here with these declines has been happening despite this no net loss standard. And so what the prey work group and the task force put forward is we need to move to this net ecological gain. And the change there is that when you have these development or land use impacts, then 
you would be moving the bar a little bit higher so that your mitigation on the end of that or your offset would be not just getting you back to that kind of zero uh, of meaning the baseline, but would be moving that farther so that you had a net gain of the habitat. Um, so that we're making some improvements, that we have assurances that we're protecting habitat the way that we need to, and that we are in effect leaving things a little bit better than where we started there. So um, that's sort of a, a core element of the healthy habitat, healthy orcas priority. Again, it's House Bill 2550. Uh, we have our first hearing um, on Monday the 28th at 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, and I'm going to look forward to questions that we have here as part of uh, this webinar. And then, of course, um, really hoping that um, uh, folks can um, you know, keep in touch and, uh, with the priority team and the uh, field teams to know how that you can most help us as we're trying to work and move this bill forward for salmon and for orcas.